welcome everybody to uh, our lecture number, what is it, number 55, C4. I've lost track, because you know what? We have so much fun here, uh, many of your change lectures. This is a very different format tonight, and you might harken back to a year ago when I had Dr. Anit Patel, who's a cardiologist, and we did a fireside chat, so you, know, you can kind of pull up and get some warmth here, and uh, <laughs> no little weenies or marshmallows, but um, this is really kind of a, a wonderful time of year to uh, have um, our guest here today. And I happen to know um, Dr. Uh, Reverend Jennifer Darity in many ways. Uh, she's been a patient of mine. Uh, she's kind of been a colleague. Uh, she is um, a, a woman of many hats, and I'll explain in a minute. Many beautiful hats. Um, so we're going to kind of do this like a chat style. In fact, uh, recently I had the pleasure of going to Ben Roy Hall and uh, hearing Melinda Gates interview uh, Joe Biden. And I feel like uh, I'm the Melinda Gates and you're the Joe Biden uh, because Melinda didn't talk very much and Joe took the show over. It was great. But um, this, is, uh, this is a perfect time of year to be kind of tackling the subject. The title is a Fireside Chat on inner strength and finding hope in challenging times. Um, this is meant really to be also a dialogue with you, so I think as we kind of chat, we can inv invite you to come in or to, to join in or to ask questions. So it's really kind of a very casual format. A um, couple promos. Look at this. We have our Many for Change potluck recipe book. Ooh, this is just dynamite. Um, there are copies over there. Um, if you want to sign up, they're only 25 bucks, so let me know. Great presents, by the way. Um, I also wanted to mention our next uh, stress management workshop, which is going to start in January. Many of you have done this already. Kira Baum, the naturopathic doc extraordinaire, um, has a series of four workshops over four Tuesdays, and they're just dynamite. So uh, check in with me or with Dr. Baum if you're interested. So. So, um, Reverend or Jennifer, if that's okay. Um, so, she is a woman of, of the times and speaks to my heart. She's married, she has three kids, count three. Uh, she has worked not just as a mom, but as a healthcare financial consultant, financial advisor. And maybe around 10, 10 years ago or so, I think you, your kids were teenagers, you kind of went down to, into a path of, of theology and divinity, and ultimately you were um, ordained for the priesthood. And I think that was, I believe, July 2014. That's right. So a couple of years ago. And so you're, you're um, associated with St. Mark's, which is just up the hill. And um, I think, you know, anyone of a religious faith, it doesn't have to be a Episcopalian, it could be anything, I think there's some, some kind of nurturing and hope and value instruction to kind of get in their perspective on some of the things that we address in our daily lives or that we're thinking of as challenges in our lives. So I've invited her here today to just kind of share some of her thoughts. And I'm going to start off with a couple of questions. We'll kind of see how, how this goes. But um, how did you kind of start down this path to priesthood? I'm kind of curious, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I would say that Ever since I was a little kid, I have wrestled with the big questions. You know, why am I here? How do I make, you know, what is the meaning of life? How do I imagine um, before I was born or after I die? I remember making myself, well, actually scaring myself to death. I was seven years old, I think, lying on my bedroom floor and thinking all of these, you know, questions that can't be answered and just scaring myself to death. So I think, um, I think it's always been in me. Um, I, you know, went to college and became um, a banker, an investment banker in New York City for 12 years. And uh, when I was there, we went to St. John the Divine, which is the Episcopal Cathedral in New York City. And um, I was raised Roman Catholic, but the first time we were at St. John the Divine, and I heard a woman say the Eucharistic prayers, which are the prayers that are said over the bread and wine. Um, for communion, it just rocked my world. It, I don't know, it stirred up something in me, this sense of wanting to be closer to um, those mysteries of life, the mysteries that happen at birth and at death, and that happen in times of joy and in times of suffering. And um, so I went, I went forward and um, 
you know, forgot about that, as we do, the dreams of our younger life, right? And um, was a banker and had three kids, two miscarriages, moved all over the place, and in my early 40s, it came back, um, this desire. And the desire wouldn't go away. And I made a deal with myself that I would um, just take one little step and see when I wanted to give it up. And after seven years, I got an MDiv at CLU, was ordained, and have served at St. Mark's Cathedral since then. So I feel like my path to priesthood is one of um, accepting the contradictions in my life. I love business. I love doing deals. <laughs> um, um, I think I give a lot of pastoral care to my clients. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of stress in being a CFO and um, a lot of existential issues that you deal with in business, you know. Um, and I love that work and I also love being a priest. I love working with people on their particular journey and learning from them. And um, so I've just accepted that's the way it is. So I know all of us juggle so many things in so many ways, but how do you, how did you do it all? You have teenagers, right, when you kind of were starting this journey, and you were doing three or four or five things at once at any given moment. How did you, <laughs> what, was, what was going on in your mind, and how did you kind of juggle all that? Um, not gracefully <laughs> would be the first answer <laughs> I would give. Um, I think my, my operating approach was to just say, I'm just going to do it, and that it's it's. I'm not going to ask how. I'm just going to take it a day at a time. Um, in reality, the only way it happened is because um, I had help in my family and in a nanny who helped care for our kids uh, when I was working and when I was going to school. Um, and I think, I, I got, I'm a perfectionist, I'm a recovering perfectionist, I should say. I think it was the experience, that was the experience that made me realize that I can't have what I want in life and be a perfectionist at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so the humility of being that mom, the only mom who didn't turn in the permission slip and who they have to track down the morning of the field trip to <laughs> turn in so your kid yes, can get on the bus. there's someone else. <laughs> That's me. It had never been me before, but it was me. Huh. And um, I learned that if you don't pay your property tax, they won't take your house away. But, you know, they you do have a chance to, um, to pay bills even if you've missed them. So um, I think it was... The, the way I did it was to really focus on the things that I cared about, let go of doing things really well, but be glad about being able to experience what it's like to be a mom and be on this spiritual path of my own uh, at the same time. How was your husband supportive in that uh, process? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Um, you know, it wasn't easy at the beginning. I think when I first decided I wanted to go to seminary, um, my husband, my children, you know, they, they all said, you have to do what you have to do, but I'm not sure I like it because I'm worried you're going to change. Um, I'm worried, you know, a lot of people, when they think about religious leaders, they imagine someone super judgmental who doesn't have any fun and who spends all their time, you know, giving advice. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think there was a sense, even among some of my family or friends, that this was going to change me. And over time, I think everybody realized that this made me more happier and made me more who I was. And we enjoyed different things together. I was all of a sudden writing papers again. And so I would sit at the kitchen counter with the kids and we would write papers together. You were doing your homework together. <laughs> we were. <laughs> We were, and for my husband, I think um, there was something about seeing me start over again and have to have beginner's mind, I guess, and let go of um, the sense of who I had built up in the business world and start all over again and find joy that um, a couple years ago he left the business world and became 
the, um, the president and CEO of the Pacific Science Center, uh, not for profit. Mm -hmm. And I think both of our journeys of leaving business to a large extent and going to work in the non for profit sector are tied up together. Mm -hmm. And he'd come from Amazon? So. He was at McKinsey and then Amazon and then where else? Um, Expedia mm -hmm. before that and then the Science Center. He actually took a year off during that time to do his own sort of midlife searching and considering his father died that year. Mm -hmm. And so he was really grateful to be able to go back and forth to Atlanta to take care of his dad and be with our kids. Our son was getting ready to graduate from high school. So it was a year of just change and transition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think often maybe a lot of us get Maybe fixate is not the right word, but uh, kind of here's our journey, and this is what we're going to keep doing, and then we'll retire and we'll have fun. But but there's so many other ways that, that you can interact with your own journey and change that and add to it. And I think it's also admirable um, as we age. You know, I think that there's um, we we might get anxious about ageism or how, like you said, your family said, well, you're going to change, and that may not be what we like. But um, to, to put your passion first, to, to kind of listen to that inner voice. And, and I think, you know, this time of year, it can be very stressful, even though the holidays are supposed to be fun. I think, you know, it's kind of a paraphrase of many, but you know, the dysfunctional stuff comes out, right? And, and everybody has this in their family, everybody. And we think of celebrating a holiday, um, as, as coming together and enjoying and being a family. It can be just like crazy, horrible. So, so how do you kind of, how do you find a peace or how do you find some of that kind of um, calm or tranquility or um, uh, satisfaction as some of, the things, some of these things get kind of frenetic? Well, I promise that if I give my answer, you guys have to tell me your way of doing it too because <laughs> yeah. I think the, the challenge of being in the midst of juggling a lot of different things or only doing one thing but dealing with life, you know, having a sick child or an ailing parent or being worried about your finances or, I mean, all of us have so much we carry. And if there's one thing I've learned as a priest, it's that there is no one without a burden they are carrying and no one who has it all figured out. Um, for me, when I find myself in a place of overwhelm, uh, whether it's the holidays or my work, you know, asking more than I feel like I can give in that amount of time, the first thing I have to do is remember that um, that idea of handling everything perfectly, you know, calmly, easily is a myth. A myth I impose on myself. And so I try to say, what is one thing I want to be able to say about Christmas? This just happened at Thanksgiving. I went, my dad's 85th birthday was the day after Thanksgiving and my family gathered. And for all kinds of our own particular family history, there was stress and worry on the part of quite a few people about being together. And I remember thinking to myself, what is it that I want to remember about this week? And it's not that I had the right clothes, or that I cooked the right food, or that um, everybody looked beautiful, or even that we all got along. It was that I had a chance to, I realized it was that I would have a chance to be with my dad in particular and just be able to know that I had told him at 85 years old that I loved him and that I had happy memories, right? So in the stress of all of that, to know that that was all I really needed to do for it to be good enough um, felt, felt really Right. I think um, at holiday time in particular, there's such this myth in our culture of what Christmas should look like, or what the other Hanukkah or the other holidays should look like, that I remember a number of times 
you know, being in the middle of shopping or even cooking, which I love doing, and having to ask myself, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. Am I doing this because I'm excited and it makes me feel light and free? Or am I doing this because I want, you know, to meet some standard? Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's an ongoing struggle. It's a, you know, the spiritual journey is never over, and the journey of losing perfectionism is never over, and the journey of being able to find um, peace in the middle of stressful times is never over. But I think it has something to do with letting go of perfection and being actively present in what's happening and being grateful for whatever we can. Yeah, I, I had a very recent experience. It's almost funny now. Uh, this was the first, I've always celebrated Christmas. Uh, we've always had a beautiful tree. When I grew up, it was very uh, European. We had candles. People always shock shocked when they grow their candles. Like, you know, burn the house down. Actually, they're safer because you never light them unless you're in the room and you're there watching them. And you prune the tree so they're perfect. And even if you go to the bathroom, you snuff them out. You're not going to leave the tree by itself. So there's far more houses that burn down from faulty electrical wiring from bulbs <laughs> than so. So I have all this kind of beautiful childhood memory. Uh, fast forward over the years, you know, we have a tree, and, and uh, fortunately, my cats have been fine. With them. This year, fascinating. Yeah, I have a lot of stress, haven't we all, for lots of reasons. This was the one year I started thinking, you know, maybe I just I'm fine without a tree. I don't need a tree. I really don't. What happened about my husband, my darling husband? <laughs> Unbeknownst to, to him, I was having this epiphany. He went out and bought the world's best tree stand. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was like, press the button, boom. I thought, oh my god. So my daughter and I went to get a tree. I thought, this is OK. And surprisingly, she will you know, her last, maybe last Christmas home, you never know. She wanted to do it all herself. I've never put a tree up without help. You, know, you have to have someone hold it and crank the thing and make sure it doesn't fall over. And it's like a two person, maybe three person. She wanted to do it by herself. OK. Well, you know what? This new stand, it really is automatic. You know, literally, you press a lever and these claws come out and walk. The tree is, is now up. I need this. Unbelievable. Yeah. And I, I was stunned. So, so actually, I had my, my gift because I didn't do a tree. It was done for me. Yeah. So I, I thought, well, you know, I was prepared just to, this is not necessary this year. And so, so maybe freeing yourself from kind of uh, traditions or, or starting a new tradition and, and having that being completely okay. That was an interesting uh, journey for me this year. Yeah. We, we did something a little bit different, that, but it was also by accident in that um, I felt like I was really behind in decorating and all of that. And so uh, we were having dinner one night, and I said to my daughters, so, you know, what decorations do you want to put up, trying to hide the fact that I hadn't done anything, thinking, you know, I really just wanted to wait and find out what was important to you, you know, before, you know, we prioritize. And it, it turns out I had no idea what mattered to them as far as our traditions went. I thought I knew what was important for my family to feel like it was Christmas. I thought that we needed a pretty big tree and that we needed, you know, um, to go Christmas shopping together or that those, those were the two things. And then also um, the cookie baking is kind of a thing because um, both my daughters are bakers. And it turns out that that wasn't what they needed for it to feel like Christmas. And so uh, we have a much smaller tree and rather than, um, doing a lot of baking, we just decided to go on a walk together. And it reminded me that it's that being together. We think it's Christmas traditions of putting stuff up or getting gifts, but I think it's just the time. People make more time for each other during the holidays. And maybe that's the Christmas tradition. Anyone have anything to share along those lines? Well, kind of along that theme, I, I would like to just ask you an open question. Um, how can we be more kind to ourselves? I think more than ever in this crazy world, politically, a lot of us are stressed and anxious, and maybe there are health concerns, or we have illness or chronic illness. Um, how, do we, how do 
I would put ourselves first. I, I've met many, many women, and men, but many women who find it selfish or they feel like um, it's expected of them and they have a hard time putting themselves first. I would say I resonate with that. I have a hard time putting myself first. Um, when you asked before, how do you do all of these things? Um, one of them is, at times, I really didn't put myself first. Um, but the good news about, about life is that we don't make a choice on one day that then holds us forever. And so putting myself first is a daily decision. It is a daily recommitment that sometimes I forget to make until dinner time. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that journey of putting myself first, I have to be almost an anthropologist in my own life. I have to get enough of a distance from, from my natural reactivity to notice when it is, when is it that I feel really free and full of energy and when is it that I feel burdened because that's putting myself first to me doesn't necessarily mean um, you know separating myself from other people or from the work that I do but prioritizing the things that give me life and joy and energy and being willing to say no to the things that I know don't and in order to do that I have to get better at noticing. Noticing when my jaw get, gets clenched. Noticing when I feel really fatigued. Mm -hmm. And then say, so, that was that thing you volunteered for. What is that telling you about um, having, are you putting my own health and well-being high enough on the list? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's developing, for me, it's been developing a practice of paying attention, saying no, being willing to disappoint, mm -hmm. um, which is very hard for a caregiver. I think you, you, that, that last phrase, be willing to disappoint, that's so difficult, isn't it? It's very difficult. I think we hold ourselves to such high standards. We would never hold someone else, a relative, a child even, mm -hmm. but we hold ourselves to that. We do. And I, I heard somebody say once that um, imagine that you loved yourself as much as you loved anyone else in your family. Now, what would you do for yourself if you were your spouse or your child or your parent? Yeah. You know, how would you speak to yourself? Yeah. How would you? Being a recovering perfectionist, I think being a recovering people pleaser is almost as mm -hmm. almost yes. as complicated. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with it? Uh, practice, <laughs> lots and lots of, of just trying, you know, small things and gradually baby steps. Do I need to do this? Do I need to do that? And nobody really seems to notice or nobody really seems to care. And then, no, I really probably don't have to do that. Isn't that the truth when you can spend your time perseverating over, really, can I say no to this? And I'll spend, you know, quite a bit of time, you know, figuring out all my plans B when I get pushback that no, you really have to do that. And then you say, no, I'm sorry, I can't. And the train moves on. <laughs> well, there's so many examples I can think of. One is um, thinking about our weight management program. Um, imagine if you picked out a party, had all the foods you think you shouldn't eat, you know, you're self-critical, and you hop on the scale the next day, why are weighing? Daily, who knows that they don't be so smart, and you've gone up three pounds, and you think, Oh, what I know better than that, that's so stupid. Well, if you had a 12 year old girl with you, and you would you say, Why are you so stupid? Why did you? Of course not. My god, you would say, Well, let's maybe there are better choices with the make next time, or you, you talk through it, or maybe just ignore it because it was a one off. But oh, we do that, and, and you, I mean, we're. we're unkind to ourselves in that way. So it's just like the standard that is too high. Much too high. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the other thing that, at least for me, has been a challenge is I forget that we all change. We all naturally change. Nothing ever stays fixed. Mm -hmm. um, 
not the pain that we're feeling, not the joy that we're feeling, that everything keeps moving. So to have to have a bad day, whether it's making bad choices around food or not getting enough sleep or making a mistake and stomping on someone's feelings when I really didn't mean it, I was tired or frustrated, that it's very, it, it's not hard to then say, well, that was today and something else is starting now. Um, one of the things, one of my pet peeves is this sense of work-life balance that women are expected to, you know, always live a balanced life, right? Yeah. We've heard balance is, you know, really good for us. Or yeah. do you have work-life balance? Well, first of all, balance assumes that there are two things that you're weighing against each other, right? right. Who has only two things right. that they are trying to make work in their life? Yeah. So yeah. That, that's annoying, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it's more that I feel like we have so much opportunity for love and connection and creativity in our lives. And if we want to dabble in all of it or experience all of it, it's going to be imperfect. Mm -hmm. But there's opportunity for little course corrections mm -hmm. every day, all the time. And we'll end up getting where we need to go. It's not like we need to you know, set the steering wheel and expect it's going to take us through, you know, the next, I don't know, five years, a year, even a day. There's always little changes. And then, of course, that dichotomy, is this, that's almost like seeing your adversaries, like the work and home life yes. are competing. Yes. I think in a way, in a corporate culture, maybe that's true, because we're crazy busy, but, you know, here's, I think we were talking about this earlier, here's where, um, uh, life in our times now, everything is 24-7, on, 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 there's no off. And so it used to be, well, no, you have cell phones, maybe you have a phone, and you didn't go to bed with that by your side, and you weren't texting and talking and so forth. And, and this constant deluge um, is both brilliant in terms of where we are as a world and technology and, and, and creativity even, but I think it's, it, the word I used when we were talking earlier is it's becoming toxic, and I think, how to kind of um, balance that. Maybe that's even better than if you work home or work life. How to kind of balance that in your day to day. I, I think that's a, that's a challenge for a lot of people. It is, and I, I find I've got three teenagers or young adults, really 22, 19, and 18. Yeah. And, and I have a smartphone and spend a lot of time with it. It's my alarm clock on my bedside table at night. And the thing about those phones and about any kind of social media is that it's so powerful, the images and the words, that it makes us act like we're living somewhere else. That there's something that's going on only in my head, and I see this in my, in my kids, they'll get upset reading something or a text or whatever will come across, but nothing has changed in the room. Mm -hmm. Nothing has changed with the people next to them but they can go from being happy to sad to angry, and it's all about imagining what's happening in this you know, piece of bread that's in their hand, basically the size of it. So how do we um, set that down and say, where are my feet, you know? Yeah. Yeah. What am I smelling? What am I touching? Who's this person next to me who I can hear breathe? Yeah. It's hard. It is. <laughs> And does this resonate with any of you? Do you okay. feel that in your day to day or in your? Yeah. Somebody I know. Who's you? <laughs> Didn't you have a no phone day? I did. Yeah. yeah. I loved it. Do you, you still have a no phone day? Once a week. Wow. One day a week. Yeah. Tuesday, right? Um, no. Well, yeah, this <laughs> quarter it's Tuesdays. Next. <laughs> Um, after January, it's going to be Thursday. His cha play changed his. Oh. I go to his kettlebell class. So I wanted, yeah, I loved it. Um, I intentionally left my phone home for the day, and I wear a watch now, mm -hmm. so I can look at my watch instead of looking at my cell phone for the time, like you know, in the old days. And it's not an Apple Watch. No, it's, it's not, not. It's not a computer. It's not, <laughs> and it's analog. It's not even digital. And it lights up, and it has big numbers, so I can see it. And I gave my digital watch away. I mean, it wasn't Apple, but it was digitized. And so, um, yeah, a no phone day. It's it's fantastic, and it kind of enhances 
my favorite word, no. You know, so um, yeah, works really well. And I'm doing it um, next week, well, after Christmas, because I'm busy with a particular project right now. But um, <laughs> yeah, after Christmas, I'm doing a no computer day. When, you know, so as well. Not on the same day as the no phone day, but a different day. So I, yeah, I may be totally generalizing, but I bet you the younger generation has a really hard time doing that. <laughs> yeah. I'm not yeah. criticizing, just an observation. <laughs> so. Yeah. That's, that sense that it's a tool, it's not an umbilical cord. You can't, you can't exactly. eat and think and move through your day and not have to have that iPad or that phone. Or, yeah, that's nice. But you know, when I did that, uh, no phone day, I got calls from three relatives. Oh my God, are you okay? I tried to, I huh. sent you a text and I didn't get a response. And I had responded the next day, but I guess it wasn't quick enough, you know, the turnaround. Wow. And so I told them what the expectation was going to be from now on. That is so telling. So, isn't it? Wow. Yeah. That's pretty powerful. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad they were concerned, but right. um, I thought it was interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. I knew there was somebody. You knew there was somebody <laughs> that had done it. <laughs> You know, my, um, one of my children had a concussion a year ago and had developed chronic headaches associated with it. And one of the things that set off the headaches was the lights from computers and from phones. Mm -hmm. And so it, she was 18. So she put her, essentially put her phone away for, turned out to be much longer than we thought, six months. Mm -hmm. And um, it was really interesting to hear her reflection on how it changed her relationship with her friends and the folks who would still continue to phone her to talk to her, yeah. or those who would come over to the house and visit her. Wow. And it was a real clarifying time. Mm -hmm. um, and she hasn't gone back now that she can be back on her phone because um, she said that it's just so much, it's so much better mom to be with somebody in person wow. than it is that. to text with them because wow. you don't really get to see their face. And so having a no phone day yeah. you know, yeah. makes so much sense just to yeah. reset that. Yeah. Well, you mentioned the word perfectionism a few times, or maybe I did too, but um, speak, to, speak to that again. I think many of us have that trait of we want to do all or be all or do it right or do it perfectly. Um, and maybe this you can answer from a religious sense or a personal sense. You know, how do you allow yourself not to do that, or how do you forgive yourself for not uh, succumbing to that? Because I think others may place that expectation or replace that expectation on ourselves a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, I believe that every one of us has a spark of the divine in us. That that is our birthright, that, you know, in, in Scripture, it says that we're made in the image of God, that humankind is made in the image of God. And so when I think about that, I, I, and they, they use the word perfect in Scripture, and, but what they don't, they don't mean perfect, like flawless. That word, perfect, meant whole or complete. And the idea is that we are complete, we are whole as we are. We're not perfect, but we are complete. And so I, I, the way I try to, I, I, I view perfectionism as um, a really harmful narrative. It's a story I tell myself that is not the truth about the beauty of being a human being. That the beauty of being a human being is our ability to love each other and connect with each other and journey together to make a community. And the way people get to love each other is not by being perfect. It's by me needing you because I'm not perfect and you needing someone else. And that our, our imperfections, and that's, one of the, that's actually one of the books that I brought that Brene Brown wrote oh. called The Gifts of Imperfection. Yeah. And the gifts, of, the gifts of imperfection are, I think, our birthright, that, um, that by knowing our own um, 
weaknesses and mistakes and proclivities, we can have more compassion for other people. Hopefully we'll also have more compassion for ourselves. And then we're drawn to be with other people because we can only um, really realize what we want in our lives by doing it together. And so that sense of community and compassion only happens because of imperfection. But it's hard. <laughs> you know, that, that myth of everything will be okay if I just do it right. Um, I actually think the first time I confronted that was the first miscarriage I had. I was 30 years old and I was a really good perfectionist and excelled and did really well at work. And I really, I realized, I really thought, not consciously, but subconsciously, that if I just did everything right, then I would be free from suffering. And here, here was your body's imperfection. Right? Yes. Well, My body's imperfection and the yeah. imperfection of the fetus, that it wasn't viable with life. Mm -hmm. And so when I lost that first baby, I, I was shocked in so many ways. I felt that I was angry at my body, I was angry at the world, I was angry at this bargain I thought I had struck. <laughs> that if I did it right, I wouldn't have to suffer. And it turns out that's not the way it works. That being human is what makes us suffer, I think. Not makes us suffer, but it's part of the bargain. If we're gonna love, we, have, we end up being open, and, and, and then it hurts. Well, that's a good segue, actually. Um, I know of many people who are grieving right now. They've had a death in the family, uh, or someone's very ill. And at this time of year, especially, um, it, it seems um, almost unfair, you know, that there's, they're having to grieve. Um, my own mother passed away eight years ago this past Sunday. It was uh, uh, December, uh, two weeks before Christmas. Yeah. and. Um, Wow, that's a, that's a blow. So what what thoughts or ideas or, or advice, I guess, can you share or comment for folks who are um, dealing with that? Well, you're right. The holidays are really hard for people who are grieving, who are feeling alone in any way. There's something about all the festivities, as false as they may sound, that makes us aware of our loneliness and um, desire to be with other people or to have our loved ones back with us. Um, one of the things that, that we do at St. Mark's is we have a blue Christmas service, which is if you're feeling blue and the holidays are not a joyful time for you, you know, you come and there's a service on the 21st. And I think what it points to is that the first thing is to um, reach out to whomever you trust and be willing to say to them, I am grieving and I don't feel like putting up a tree and it hurts like hell to remember what it was like to be with my mom and not have her here. And above all, tell the truth about what you're experiencing and share that with another human being in person if possible. Um, grief takes the time that it's going to take. And I don't think there's any way to rush it. And the, it feels worse when we pretend that it's not there. Um, and grief doesn't last forever. I think at the times I've grieved in my life, it feels so consuming that it really, I, I don't see how it will ever get better. And of course it does. It does with time and with the mystery of love from others and I think the resilience that we all have, that we, we want to live. And so somehow we manage to push through it. I don't know, what do you all think about grief this time? Interesting. My family is just, you know, I'm 
it's an age thing to a certain extent, but siblings have passed away. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's going to be a quiet Christmas, and I think that's okay. Mm -hmm. I love what you said, though, about not being alone, like having at least one other person to share that with, because then that can kind of bring out from you things that are hard to do on your own and give you support that maybe you didn't even think you needed. And that's, that's very nice. Yeah. I mean, I know you have family around you. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. The flip side is a, a, an older sister who showed up out of nowhere in the spring. The timing was like, thank you. <laughs> so there's that. But just, I don't know, I'm just, I keep thinking this first Christmas is going to be it's going to be tough. Just that it shrink. <laughs> yeah. um, my younger sister and I talked and, you know, yes, we definitely need to get together. We definitely need to do something, whatever it is. So, but, um, I don't know. be interesting, I think, looking forward to see what new traditions come out. I'm, I'm curious about um, you're mentioning loneliness and the and kind of in the same spot space as grief, mm -hmm. and it made I, I started thinking. So I understand loneliness as being part of grief, but what else is there that's part of it? That's part of grief. Yeah, because. The next thing that popped up into my head was guilt. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of grief is living in the past, and well, let me say this differently: not living in the past, but remembering the past. Mm -hmm. wow. And whether we remember it happily or with regret, it's painful. Mm -hmm. Because if it's happy, we rem it feels like we'll never have that kind of happiness again. And if it's painful, there's a feeling of I can never make it right. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of grief, I think, is having to come to terms with what we can't control, which mm -hmm. is the past. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, that, and trying to forgive ourselves for mistakes that we made or to realize that we did the best we could. Mm -hmm. And so, I, yeah, the thinking about the past is part of a grief. Mm -hmm. Guilt, I think, maybe is related to that. Um, I think mourning, mourning different futures is part of grief. Mm -hmm. That, you know, I always thought when I got pregnant with that baby, I knew that baby. I wrote letters to that baby. I had a future for that baby, and that never that never happened. Mm -hmm. And so, some of moving through that grief was being able to realize that I had pinned hopes or expectations on particular things happening. Mm -hmm. Can I come back to you? We'll see whether I can talk without my throat clenching. But um, my father passed away this year, but um, I've been working with another doctor here uh, in coaching. and. What it, the grief of that was so completely different from another grief in my life, which is a, sort of that guilt, you know, what did I miss? The grief of, I guess I would say, of my father being able to make a decision to say, I, it, I am going to go on hospice, and to have that phenomenal support. You know, it's long enough now that I forget how sick he was, <laughs> um, but it also, there's no grief because you're sort of invited into that process and you really end up realizing that it's the most natural thing in the world. It's just part of nature, but what matters is showing up. And if you've shown up, I 
think that is one of the gifts of hospice. I worked um, as a spiritual care intern for a while with hospice, and I was always amazed at the kind, even though there may not, well, there wasn't a cure for the people that we were caring for, but there was so much healing yes. that could happen. And and it's it's a it's true. I mean, statistically, but also with what you're speaking to is that that experience of being present for the journey toward death with someone we love um, goes better for everyone. That family members grieve differently, and it's not that you can grieve easily, but there isn't as much depression among people whose family members moved through hospice with them. Um, there's, a, there's a mystery there, you're right, about being there and experiencing it and not bearing witness together to something. And I, and I think at the same time it does crystallize what time do we have left and what do we want to do, which gets back to Okay, I can't do that as a perfectionist. So I'm going to have to do it as a, the best I can manage it sometimes. It's not going to be very, very pretty or elegant, but, um, but I do think it's also just that process of how much time, you, know, you don't know how much time you have, but what do you want to do if you are fortunate enough to be able to make choices? Yes. Yep. Well, Mo, your story is so beautiful, and I've seen you go through that process with your father, and I admire the, the passion and the kindness and the love that you showed him. Um, so I, I want to thank you for your comment, because that's really, it's really raw. This is a perfect time to just kind of lead into my last question, I guess, or comment. Um, and I want to talk about hope. Um, Again, I had the pleasure of, of going to see Joe Biden and uh, a lot of stress in the world and even talked politics a few times, but the whole point of that evening was really not to talk about politics. He talked about his personal life and journeys, which also includes sorrow with the death of his son and so forth. But he really struck a chord when he talked about hope. And it wasn't a corny, artificial, like, yay, we're all going to be fine. It was just looking deep inside of what we care about or what he was passionate about, caring about the world and about community and about others. I just wanted to hear your comments about hope uh, for the, t the present time or for the future. Well, I think hope is like air. We have to have it to live. Um, and I don't think hope is a feeling, like I feel optimistic. Um, for me, hope feels like a decision or a choice or a stance. It's a posture I take or try to take. Um, and that is one of choosing to turn toward places in my life where I feel loved, where I can give love, where I can connect with other people. And having the strength to remember and sort of um, have, a, have a touch point of, of knowing the resilience of life, you know? I think it's, for me, it involves where I find hope a lot of the time is I go walking around my garden or the neighborhood and I pay attention to what the flowers are doing or what the, I mean, it's just amazing in the springtime, isn't it? Everything is so dead. Yeah. And then these little things start poking up. <laughs> and I think of, and, and that happens, right? Year after year after year, there is such a desire for life that exists in creation and in the human spirit, that I trust that. 
I trust that 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 is stronger than any amount of despair or worry that I can feel. And I remember one time I was, um, my husband was away traveling and I was home with our kids and it wasn't a good night and it seemed like every kid came to me at a different time and wanted to talk for an hour and was really miserable and it just felt so heavy. I couldn't fix any of their problems and it always happens after 10 o'clock at night, right? If they want to talk. And all you can do is listen because if you say something, it's the wrong thing. And so it just, I was feeling so not up for the job and like I could do nothing. And I remember standing in my kitchen and it occurred to me that my mother and my grandmother and my great-grandmother and her mother had all done the same thing. They had all sat up with kids in the kitchen with sick relatives and it is on their love and faithfulness that I get to have the opportunity to feel the same struggle. Wow. Um, so I'm not sure that answered your question about hope, but... Oh, it does. <laughs> it gives me hope. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think that we are wired to seek love and seek each other, and that that's going to be what's going to get us through this crazy time politically. When I talk of, of a woman I know who died um, two weeks ago at 100, um, used to tell me her stories when I would visit her, just about all the things that she faced and her parents faced, and um, you know, I would go. I go on these pastoral visits, and you know, people think that I'm bringing something to the person who is, you know, infirm or um, at the end of their life. And I always come. Oh, I always come away with so much more because um, they just they just show me how we persevere together. It, and and then we get that courage from just choosing to go through it together and to look for the opportunities to love and care for each other. Those are our life lessons. Wow. I can still feel the warmth here. It's just amazing. <laughs> um, well, I don't have any other questions, but if you all had any things you wanted to talk about, Why I, I just have this abiding interest in the Bronze Age because I'm like, mm, where were there women who were spiritual leaders? And I think it's been thousands of years, actually. Okay. I mean, I, uh, I, my, my grandfather would have passed out in the middle of the pew. Um, but it is so interesting to me that this was happened in my life. I grew up with the nuts, but they never said sacristy. Well, you know, uh, in my business life, my financial yeah. life, um, I serve not-for-profit hospital systems, especially uh, Roman Catholic-based systems. Somehow that became my yeah. sort of specialization in my 30s. And I feel like women religious, and Sisters of Mercy in particular, and Sisters of Charity, they nurtured me on my quest to priesthood. And they blessed me along the way, um, both literally and um, practically. And, um, you know, there's a long tradition of women leaders in the church and in the spiritual life that goes back to, um, you know, pre-Christian days when right. men were spiritual leaders. And, um, you know, whoever writes history gets to choose who they describe the lives of and who they don't, but um, when we look for it, there are women all throughout history who were spiritual leaders. And I am so um, inspired by them. And there are today too, for sure. And all different traditions um, who 
more, I think, and I think what I love about hearing them speak is so often they use the practical experience of life, um, whether it's caring for a family or cooking or gardening or um, doing laundry. You know, the, the, it's not heady stuff that their inspiration and their sense of meeting that mystery of love is making tamales with the woman next door. Mm -hmm. And it is really cool, having been raised Roman Catholic, to um, participate in the sacraments. It just blows my mind. Yeah. <laughs> Your daughters are lucky. <laughs> <laughs> they are really, um, they inspire me. They really do. And um, I think one of the unforeseen gifts of my making this midlife um, transition is that my daughter who was struggling with the concussion and all of that, she said, you know, Mom, people make changes all the time. It's never too late to try something new. And I think so often kids get this narrative that there's one path to success and there's one, and all of us, that there's, you know, by the time I'm 53, which I am, you know. You're done. I'm done. Yeah. But that is so not true. This is the time of life in 50s and 60s and 70s. Yeah. I know a woman who didn't start painting until she was 78. And she is a serious, prolific, beautiful painter. So I think it's giving ourselves permission to have that creativity come back. Mm -hmm. Once and we don't give a shit about, you know. And not necessarily accepting somebody else's yeah. narrative. Right. You know, like you said, there's always been women in leadership, but they might not have been the ones that got talked about the most or noted the most. Um, you know, I think I, I, your idea of the course corrections kind of spoke to me. Because it's like, where would, and I'm using I just in a general sense, but where would a person get the idea that you're going to get on this path and that you're just going to go you know, you're going to go straight to wherever it is your end desire is, and that's never going to change, and you're never going to run into any complications. And the reality with my different midlife things is that I'm slowly coming to appreciate that, you know, I didn't know what half my options were when I was coming up with this life game plan, and now the world's an entirely different place, that game plan might not fit this anymore. It's a whole right. new game. Can't keep playing it with the old rules or I'm going to miss out on a lot of the game. Mm -hmm. So true, so true. Well, I'm going to break. If uh, people need to get home, please drive home safely. You can mm -hmm. continue to gather and just chat offline. Um, but thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for the opportunity. It yeah. was really a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I did want to say we had um, Brene um, Brown's book um, in our book club section, and we had a good discussion. Okay. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, totally. Through Mini for Change. Yeah, yeah, she's amazing. That's great. And then the other one, just a plug for the Dalai Lama and oh, Desmond Tutu. You may have this one on your list as well. Oh, that would <laughs> The Book of Joy is that on your list too? Uh, I don't think I don't so. Know it's on book. Book. Yeah, it might be. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. It's you know, one of the pillars of joy. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, very practical.